Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a learning and growing webinar on food insecurity among college students implications for learning mood behavior cognition and physical health. Our presenter today is Jared Brown of Concordia sorry Concordia University St. Paul, Minnesota. My name is Sidra and I'll be your moderator today for Hawks Learning. We will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions you have into the Q&A module as we go, and we'll be sure to answer them. I'll now hand it over to our presenter. Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. Thank you so much for tuning in for today's webinar presentation. We're going to take a deep dive into the topic of food insecurity, and I'm going to try to link it back as much as possible to working with college students. My name is Jared Brown. If you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A box throughout. And if you have any questions after today's training, please don't hesitate, reach out anytime. Here's my email address. If you want a copy of my slides, feel free to shoot me an email. If you're looking for some additional resources on any of these topics, I can definitely send you some recommended readings and different links to other kinds of sources. So if you never heard me present for Hawks Learning before, I'm a professor, trainer, researcher, and consultant. I'm, I'm doing a lot more work in the area of integrated behavioral health, and nutrition and a number of other related topics. And one of those topics I'm starting to do more trainings on for various groups is related to food insecurity. Just wanted to just point this out so you know where I'm coming from. These are some of my certifications and other credentials as well. I'll be pulling in some of this literature as well. I have different certifications related to nutrition, the gut, sleep disorders. So I'm going to try to weave that in into today's training as well. I believe all of you have seen a copy of the training description. And I just also wanted to point this out. I do a lot of consultation work. I do quite a bit of work in the area of just developing different trainings for all kinds of groups. And these are the areas that really guide the work I do. And I point this out is if you really want to understand complex human behavior, if you're ever working with someone that has a lot of behavioral problems or different kinds of challenges, in my experience, these areas of study have really helped me better understand really complex human behavior, irrational behavior, deviant behavior. If you're working with students that really struggle with all kinds of different things in terms of just staying focused and maybe having more irritable problems or behavioral problems in the, in the classroom. Some of these fields of study might help you better understand what's going on at a deeper level. And one of those topics that we're going to talk about today is food insecurity. And I'm going to link it back to a lot of these different variables here as well. So when we think of food insecurity, there, there's an actual food security spectrum. So on one side of the spectrum, you could have someone that has all the appropriate foods that they need. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you will have famine, which you'll see obviously more in certain countries. So that's the most extreme end of the spectrum. In the United States, a couple terms you'd want to be aware of is food deserts and food swamps. I've consulted on multiple cases over the years where the clients may have had plenty of food, but they haven't had access to nutritional food. So that's another aspect of this as well. And when we think of true food insecurity, it is a stressor. It is a trauma. So we re really need to look at it through a stressor and trauma lens as well. And it has significant implications for student learning. And I, I was just shocked when I started digging into these topics, how many studies have actually been published on food insecurity within the context of college students. And what I will say right now is, if any of you are college professors, and if we believe what the research says at the national level, there could be 40 to 50% of your students that might be dealing with some level of food insecurity and also consider how COVID-19 has really amplified a lot of these things as well. And we'll talk about that today. So when we start thinking about food insecurity, if you look at the literature, 
it really is a significant public health problem. It's a clinical issue. So if any of you are working in mental health, it's a forensic issue. There are plenty of studies that talk about food insecurity being a factor to take into account when, when we're studying criminal behavior. So again, it falls on a spectrum of severity. You can have minor kinds of instances of food insecurity, and you can have extreme measure, just significant implications that this can have for human health. The research is pretty clear on this too, that people that deal with some level of food insecurity, particularly over a longer period of time, may be at greater risk of being overweight, having diabetes, hypertension issues. It could be a factor to take into account when we are considering like cardiovascular disease. Plenty of evidence points to the fact that food insecurity amplifies mental health issues. So depression, anxiety, and oftentimes when people are dealing with true inse food insecurity, it's oftentimes associated with poverty, lower socioeconomic status, problems with finding affordable housing. We'll dig into all of these topics today. These are just some statistics. There's multiple statistics out there, but again, through a college lens, a sizable minority of college students around the country, according to this research, do deal with food insecurity. Other things you'd wanna consider, some other consequences that frequently come up in this research literature is the fact that it may be associated with higher incidence of dental problems, asthma, arthritis. It could play a role in restricting daily life activities for some students. So these can be significant barriers for that student to be successful in college. So when we think about food security, this is truly a multifaceted concept. So we know food insecurity, not having access to the proper amounts of food, the right kinds of food nutritionally, or not having access to any food. Food security, if you look at this literature, they really talk about it as being a basic human right. When we have good food security, we will have access to the appropriate amounts of nutritious foods that our bodies and brains need. So we're gonna cover the, the more difficult side of the spectrum today in greater detail. So when we think about the major characteristics associated with food insecurity, these are some of the variables that you would wanna take into account. Other factors that can contribute to an increase in food insecurity is if you're ever working with someone that's had a long-standing history of social exclusion, so not having a lot of social support, social isolation. Obviously, as I mentioned before, this can be associated with higher incidence of poverty, lower socioeconomic status, and even homelessness. We also have to consider neighborhood characteristics. So if any of you have studied these topics, you're probably familiar with like food deserts and food swamps. And if you're familiar with that literature, certain neighborhoods may not have a lot of access to nutritional foods. Maybe in some of those neighborhoods, lots of gas station foods, lots of processed foods. It is very important to understand neighborhood dynamics and socioeconomic factors when we talk about this topic. Other things to consider, just to visually lay it out here, these are different categories that are found in this research literature. In addition to this, the evidence in the literature really points to the fact that people with true food insecurity may skip meals more frequently. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, why that's so important to take into account and why that can have a significant impact on student learning. Food insecurity is also associated with lower intakes of fruits, vegetables, and fiber. And it's been associated with increased intakes of added sugars, fast food, and processed foods like ultra processed foods, fast food consumption. I've done a couple other trainings for Hawks Learning. You can check out on like sugar sweetened beverages and its impact on college students. I talked about some of these variables in that training as well. So food swamps. So what, what are food swamps? Typically, they're going to be in urban environments where there's few grocery stores, 
but lots of access to like corner stores, fast food restaurants, and typically these neighborhoods lack fresh, healthy options. It is a huge topic to take into account. There's multiple studies that talk about this. Food deserts is something we all need to be aware of. When we think of food deserts, typically these are neighborhoods that will have limited access as well to healthy and affordable foods. People that live in food deserts are more likely to be dealing with obesity issues, diabetes, cardiovascular risk factors. These neighborhoods that are dealing with food deserts and food insecurity and food swamps, unfortunately, lots of health inequities, social inequities, and even the research says that some of the neighborhoods that are classified under this umbrella may lack appropriate transportation. So lots of barriers to take into account. Unfortunately, when we study food insecurity, it is often associated with a higher consumption of ultra processed foods. Why should you care about that? Let's say the student is consuming fast food day in and day out. If that's the case, they're getting high consumptions of sugar, processed foods, added coloring, flavorings, emulsifiers, all of these things have been linked with more gut health problems, more behavioral problems, more cognitive brain-based problems. So an over-reliance on ultra-processed foods, such as like sugar-sweetened beverages, eating lots of French fries and burgers and pizzas and frozen foods and gas station foods and microwavable foods really are a threat to human health, the research indicates. And while we're talking about ultra processed foods, fast food consumption falls under that umbrella. And you will find plenty of studies that point to the fact that college students are a very high consumer of fast food. And again, maybe in the short term, the person might not have any consequences or side effects from that. But over the long haul, excessive consumption of fast food and ultra processed foods has been linked with more behavioral problems hyperactivity issues, depression, daytime fatigue. It's been linked with having more metabolic issues, so cholesterol issues, weight gain, things of that nature. And the research also is pretty clear on this, that sugar-sweetened beverage consumption is typically higher among individuals that fall under this umbrella of food insecurity. And unfortunately, from the research literature as well, college students also consume a high amount of sugar-sweetened beverages, including energy drinks. So being aware of that literature as well, I would highly encourage you to maybe take a look at that other training I did for Hawks Learning on that topic. So the consequences associated with this, again, are all over the map. So a behaviorally, depression, anxiety, in some studies, it does point to the fact that a high degree of food insecurity could be a potential driver or risk factor in some cases for suicidal behavior and substance misuse as well. Other consequences, just to visually point it out here. So food insecurity is associated with a number of poor health outcomes. So it might be more likely for some students that truly are dealing with this. They might get sick more often. They might miss class more often. Higher incidence of asthma, unfortunately. Neurocognitive problems. We're gonna talk about executive function today, but we're, when we think of neurocognitive issues, that goes to the heart of learning, attention, memory, being able to stay focused, listening to your lectures. It can absolutely erode their academic success. When we think of psycho-emotional issues, depression, anxiety, mood-related problems, and social skills. This has also been linked in some cases with having more social skill impairments. So in some cases, maybe the college student might have difficulty making friends and finding friends. Other things to take into account, just, some vis just to visually point it out here, again, the study after study indicates that food insecurity is a true threat to emotional and behavioral and cognitive health. I just threw this in here because I did do a training for Hawks Learning previously on autism. 
among college students. And you, you will find several studies too that talk about autism and food insecurity may be higher than what we realize. So if you're ever working with students on the autism spectrum, food insecurity could be one variable to take into account when trying to support the needs of a college student who has autism. And the same with ADHD. Now we know that ADHD is one of the most frequently diagnosed disorders in childhood, but there's probably a good chance that if you are a college professor, you're working in the college arena, you're probably interacting with college students who have ADHD on a semi-regular basis. And this is another variable that we'd want to consider when working with students who have true ADHD. And food insecurity has been linked with having higher incidence of attention, learning, and memory problems among people with some of these disorders. I'm going to park the brakes just for a second. That was the first section, just a, a foundational overview. Open it up to any thoughts or questions. Again, I should have mentioned this in the beginning. I'm throwing multiple hours of content at all of you in less than an hour, so take that into account. Going once, going twice. All right, we'll go on to the next section. So as this relates specifically to college students, lots and lots of studies have talked about this topic within this context. Just a few things I underline from this particular study. It really is a hidden problem. It, it You can't look at a student in most cases and, and tell that student is dealing with food insecurity a lot of times. There's a lot of shame attached to this. The person may look like they're functioning just fine on the outside, but inside they might be nutritionally deprived. So it is a hidden problem. Is it an epidemic? Maybe on some level, if you look at the statistics, I mean, if we're talking 40 to 50% of students in college may be dealing with some level of food insecurity, that is a huge, huge number. And it's a huge deficit to that student's success as they try to move through the college life. Other things just to consider again, when we think of food insecurity among college students, again, if they're not getting the appropriate amount of nutrition, their brains are not getting the appropriate amount of fuel to be able to be as successful as possible in the classroom. So this could be a huge hindrance to your student success in the classroom, interacting with other students, interacting with faculty in some cases. And again, when we talk about food insecurity, take into account it is associated with all kinds of emotional, behavioral, and physical health challenges, to name a few. A couple things we want to consider if we start looking at this through an academic performance lens. Food insecurity is a big variable that we want to take into account, but we want to look at some of these other variables as well. It's not just the food insecurity that could be getting in the way of your student's success. Living a sedentary lifestyle, so students that just never exercise and don't move at all, that's actually been linked with having more performance issues in school. Overweight status, obesity could be a factor, actually, the research indicates. If you work with college students who are dealing with a very high level of stress, especially if that stress is chronic or toxic, that could be a huge hindrance for your student's success in the academic arena. Lower socioeconomic status, as we know, is often associated with food insecurity. But just living in poverty in a homeless kind of situation, obviously that is a huge stressor, a worry, a fear, a trauma. That's a huge barrier as well. If that student has lack of support from family or friends, another huge variable. And two other things I briefly mentioned, but let's go a little bit deeper in the weeds on this. If you have students that seem to consume a very high amount of sugar, that's actually been linked with more academic problems. And if you have students that have a tendency to skip meals, particularly breakfast, 
that's another big variable to take into account. I'll talk about that in a few minutes in much greater detail. So during the era of COVID-19, you will, you will find several studies that have talked about food insecurity was amplified. You'll find a lot of studies. This is a really good study that was published in 2022. But think about during the heart of COVID, during the lockdowns, all the stress, the worry, the fear, the uncertainty, and the disruptions in day-to-day -day routines. A lot of students obviously were impacted by this. Faculty were impacted by this. So just consider the topic of COVID-19 as being an accelerant, being a stressor. When we think about COVID, when I give talks on COVID, I've given a lot of talks on COVID through the behavioral health lens over the last couple of years. I often talk about the disruptions in day-to-day -day routine. So work-life balance changes, mealtime habit changes, even snack time habit changes really changed during the era of COVID-19 for a lot of people. How we socialize, our exercise habits, our sleep habits, our technology use habits, that's another factor to take into account. Excessive screen time exposure is another variable that's sometimes talked about in conjunction with poor dietary practices. And a big part of the stress for a lot of people, according to the research and based on some of the cases I've consulted on too the last few years, the level of uncertainty. It could be financial or economic uncertainty. It could be health or housing uncertainty, relationship uncertainty, that fear of the unknown, doubt, skepticism, maybe it's mistrust, worry, fear, anxiety, depression. Some people during this time, the research pointed to the fact they may have gained, really engaged in higher levels of stress-related eating. Some research studies have pointed to the fact that weight gain went up during the era of COVID-19, more sleep problems, all of these things. If that student was impacted by this, these are things that we need to take into account because these things still could be lingering in that student. And maybe they're dealing with a lot of unresolved grief, worry, whatever's going on. If they carry that over into the classroom, that can also negatively impact academic performance. So study after study really points to the fact that food insecurity among college students can have a very negative impact on academic outcomes. When we look at this more broadly, food insecurity is one major variable we wanna take into account, but what are some other variables you'd wanna consider? Maybe the student is dealing with a number of internal factors, problems at home. Maybe there's some medical issues going on. Maybe they're dealing with an undiagnosed sleep disorder. Could they be dealing with a neurological disorder in some cases or an undiagnosed learning disability or maybe even sensory impairments that can really get in the way of learning? Students with sensory impairments oftentimes will become overwhelmed where there's a lot of commotion or background noise, bright lights, being around a lot of people at one time. And all of these things can also impact motivation. So though there's some internal causes that could impact academic performance, external causes would be food insecurity. The school environment could be a hindrance for some students in some cases, depending on a number of factors. Excessive screen time exposure is a type of external cause. So the takeaway point here is when you have students that are dealing with poor academic performance, there's probably a lot of layers going on. It's not just one variable. There's probably a combination of external factors and internal factors that come together and make performance in the classroom more difficult. Other things to take into account when we look at this through a college lens, negative food behaviors. This could be stress-related eating. It could be emotional eating. When we think about negative food behaviors, a couple things you want to consider. Skipping meals could be a negative food behavior that's maybe associated with increased levels of stress. 
How does your student handle stress? Do they turn to food as a form of comfort? Over time, that can contribute to a host of issues. Weight gain in particular is one. So think about when you're the student, if you're noticing like unusual or negative food behaviors, a lot of times this could be rooted in food insecurity, lots of stress going on in that student's life. Take a curiosity-based approach. Maybe refer that student, if appropriate, to the school counselor and dig deeper into this. Because if you can tackle and target food insecurity and negative food behaviors, that can be life-changing for some individuals and it can help enhance academic performance. This is some interesting research findings. I just wanted to throw on this slide and at the bottom of my slides are my full citations. And again, if you'd like a copy of my slides, just shoot me an email, but just thinking about this, typically food insecurity is going to be higher among post-secondary freshman students in some cases, depending on a number of factors, depending on the region of the country, depending on family factors. But this is something still that can impact students in graduate school and beyond. So it's not just four-year degree seeking students. It could be anyone who's seeking a degree. So taking that into account. Other things we'd want to take into account as we go a little bit deeper, when we think about lifestyle habits among college-based students, the research points to the fact that in a lot of cases, again, not every case, of course, but university students may be more prone to having more poor lifestyle habits. Food insecurity may be under the surface, but some of these other lifestyle habits is frequent snacking it's talking about. And it's usually not snacking on things that are healthy. Eating out a lot, so lots of fast food consumption. Overnight eating. If you look at some of that literature, people who eat a lot overnight, they might have more metabolic issues. They might have more behavioral problems the next day. These are variables that are more common among university students. Again, remember I spoke about before, higher consumptions of sugar-sweetened beverages, higher consumptions of energy drinks. There are all kinds of factors to consider if we look at this through a college lens. A lot of other things to consider when we think about why do people do what they do in terms of lifestyle habits, eating habits, could be just the way we grew up, what kind of family we were in. It could have a lot to do with access. Maybe there's limited transportation on that college campus and that student only has access to maybe fast food joints, vending machines, um, gas station foods. So we need to consider access, transportation. These are different interventions we'll talk about in a little bit. Cost is another factor. So if you're working with university students and they just don't have a lot of money, they probably don't have the means to purchase higher quality foods. So we need to be aware of location, proximity, cost, transportation barriers, these are things to start considering if we wanted to kind of develop like a holistic kind of intervention plan when starting to work with university students. So lower socioeconomic status, it could be full-blown poverty, it could be full-blown homelessness, but when we think about lower socioeconomic status, a couple things you'd want to consider is I think just in the back of your mind, screen for limited resources. So when we think about, does that student have limited resources? What would fall under that umbrella? Would they have limited job seeking skills where that's a barrier, where they just don't have the skills to fill out a job application effectively? Maybe they struggle with social anxiety and they really struggle in a job interview. That could be a barrier. Low educational levels as well. So maybe that student really struggled in high school. They're in college now and they're still struggling. That can be a factor. Having limited access to a social support system is a huge barrier. So if that student's running into, into a jam financially and they have no one to turn to, that's a factor. And maybe they run up credit cards and things of that nature. And now they're dealing with poor credit, all kinds of things to consider. When you work with people that have very limited resources, in some cases, 
this could contribute to poor coping skills as well. So if you notice your student has a tendency to have really ineffective or concerning or unhealthy kinds of coping skills, another variable that we wanna take into account. And another a couple other factors just to consider is the student dealing with any kind of mental health related challenges, particularly that are undiagnosed or untreated or unmanaged? And are they dealing with some level of housing insecurity as well? In this research literature on food insecurity, it talks a lot about if we want to combat this problem, helping students find stable housing as well, because lack of appropriate housing is a huge barrier for people to be able to cook their own meals. That is just one factor of many. Other things to consider, this is a really interesting research finding. Take a look at this. When we, when we think about this kind of on the national or even international level, this is a variable to take into account that could play a role in food insecurity. By no means am I saying it's the only factor, but if you look at some of the studies that have been done on this nationally and internationally, a very high percentage of universities have a lot of vending machines. And typically in these vending machines are foods that are not that good for someone, if we're being brutally honest. When I was in college in my four-year degree, that's all you saw, vending machines everywhere, fast food joints, all kinds. I didn't see any healthy food anywhere. This is a variable to take into account, and this could be a particular intervention for colleges to start really considering. Are you starting to offer healthier food choices in your vending machines as well? Other things to consider, think about some of the predictors of this. So I mentioned this before, housing insecurity, huge factor. So if that student is homeless, or couch surfing just does not have a stable living environment, that is a huge barrier. Unfortunately, too, we know from the research literature that homelessness among college students is not uncommon. Some college students will be homeless, so we need to consider this. These are huge predictors of increased levels of food insecurity. Another interesting research finding for us just to take into account, and I, I'm, I'm not sure what we do about this, but maybe there's something at the national or federal level that could be done about this, but this is just an interesting research finding that these folks in this study found that the prevalence of food insecurity was higher at the end of the fall and spring semesters compared to the beginning when financial assistance is greater. So basically, students are getting financial aid during the first few weeks or months of, of that um, term, they're probably using some of that money to also purchase food. It's just a variable to take into account. This does not impact every student by any stretch, but it is something just to consider if we're talking about identification, screening, and intervention. A lot of things underlined here that I just want to reiterate. So when we think about food insecurity, it can be a major distraction and barrier for academic success, as well as de degree completion. So for some students, if they are not completing their degree, has anyone considered, could food insecurity be a variable in some cases? Other variables to consider when we think about this, is the student working a ton of hours, overnight shifts, and they are consuming lots of energy drinks, fast food, all of that can be a factor. And in some cases, if you have students that continually take your classes and maybe they don't come with the proper textbooks or proper materials that are required in your course syllabus, take a step back, be curious. Could there be more to the story going on? Could some of these students actually be dealing with a high degree of food insecurity and they're taking the money that they were planning to use for textbooks and learning materials, but they decided to buy food instead? That could be a variable that we might wanna consider as well. From a neurobiological perspective, so when we think of neuro, think of the brain, neuroscience, biological, like hormones, 
blood sugar levels, things of that nature. It's pretty clear too from this research literature that food insecurity, depending on the severity, of course, can have a profound impact on neurocognitive functioning. So attention, learning, and memory. And at the biological level, it could increase cortisol levels. So cortisol levels, when you think of cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone. It's not a bad thing on the surface, but if someone is dealing with a high degree of stress over and over and over again, high levels of cortisol have been linked with all kinds of health problems. If you've heard me talk before, you know I talk a lot about the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal axis. That is our body's main stress response system. It's a hormone regulator. And the end product of that access is cortisol. So the takeaway point here is if your student is dealing with a high degree of food insecurity, it's likely impacting them at the hormonal level as well, which can impact mood, behavior, and attention. Very important to consider this through a neurobiological lens. Disinhibition. If you were part of that training I did for Hawks learning previously on executive dysfunction, you know, we talked about disinhibition. Think of disinhibition as our internal parking brake not working. So you're driving down the road and your car brakes go out. That's disinhibition. For our brains, if we have bad disinhibition, we're going to be more impulsive. We're going to be more erratic. We probably have a tendency to interrupt the instructor more often. We probably are going to be more disruptive in group activities in the classroom. We're going to be bouncing around. These are people... When they have disinhibition, more impulse control issues, more self-control deficits, food insecurity can impact the brain, which contributes to more executive function problems, which contributes then to more disinhibition. A couple of things you'd want to consider if you're interested in this topic is if someone has true disinhibition, poor self-control, consider their eating habits. Consider their sugar consumption habits, their driving habits. They have a tendency to not pause and reflect. They have a hard time taking in the information you're saying to them in the classroom because their brain is just so scattered. Disinhibition is a very important topic to consider when we're trying to help students kind of put the brakes on, pause, reflect, think through their actions, and take the time to maybe listen more rather than interrupting constantly. So the meal skipping, we spoke about that briefly before. So when we think of meal skipping, why is this important? Why should we care about this? Because if a student skips breakfast that morning, comes to your class, that likely will impact their blood sugar levels. When that happens, we might be dealing with low grade hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar levels. If we're dealing with low blood sugar levels, that means we have less glucose circulating in our body and glucose is metabolic fuel for our brain. So think of glucose as the gasoline for an automobile. The gasoline in our body is we're running low, we're running empty and our brains need that fuel to think properly. This is a huge factor for your student maybe struggling in your classroom, especially in the morning hours. This can impact their energy levels. They might have less memory or attention or concentration capabilities. This has been linked with having more problem solving deficits and more emotional dysregulation as well. I'm not telling you to go tell your student to have breakfast every day, but maybe they would do well working with like your school counselor or, or like a healthcare provider and get some education on that because that is another intervention that could potentially help improve academic performance and outcomes for your students. Another variable that we need to take into account is the fact that a lot of studies point to the fact that a higher percentage of college students may actually be dealing with lower levels of nutritional literacy. This is another intervention to consider. When we think of nutritional literacy, Think of it as that skill or ability for us to really understand 
and be able to access health information. How do we read labels? Do we know what sugar grams are? Do we know how to read calories? How do you prepare a meal? These are all things related to nutritional literacy. What is the student's food related knowledge like? Maybe the student has no clue that eating fast food every single day is not good for them. Maybe they've never even considered that. Do they have any clue that consuming a high degree of sugar sweetened beverages or energy drinks can impact health? When I was in my four year degree, I had no clue about any of this stuff. So I think just educating students about these things can make a huge difference in improving health outcomes on a lot of levels. If we look at the consequences associated with food insecurity specifically to college students, this is a small snapshot of some of the studies that are out there. It may actually play a role in lower grade point averages as well. So if you're working with students that seem to have really low grade point averages, but you can tell that they're just not meeting their full capabilities, could that be a factor in some cases? By no means am I saying every case, but could it be a factor in some of the cases? Maybe. And again, if you have students that seem to have more behavioral problems, mood swing issues, they're just irritable. They just seem to, you're like walking on eggshells around that student all the time. You feel like you're always saying something wrong and that student is always upset. That could be a factor. In some cases, students with food insecurity can look like they have ADHD when in fact, maybe it's rooted in nutritional deficiencies. And again, why do we care about this beyond all of these things? Because it's a huge barrier for some students to actually complete college. So if you are really focusing on enhancing degree completions at your university, I don't know how many students are impacted by food insecurity who end up dropping out of school. But if we look at the research, it's probably some. So this could be a, a piece of the puzzle to help combat that. Other things to consider when we think about food insecure students. So if your college has this, if your college has opportunities to provide education, training curriculums to students regardless of degree programs i think we could all benefit from learning about these topics including faculty if we can increase our nutrition knowledge regardless of what role we play at the, at the school i think this is a, a huge thing for us as professionals too to play a role in reducing burnout other things limited earning potential so again food insecure students their brains might not be working properly that could be a huge barrier to finding a job keeping a job it can actually get in the way of budgeting skills so if your student struggles with budgeting money that's probably rooted in some form of an executive function impairment to name a few other contributing factors that you'll find in this literature uh, this is more nationwide. This isn't particular to any kind of university, but the rising cost of tuition is a factor. Some students not qualifying for financial aid and housing cost as well. We know that housing costs are going up everywhere, regardless if it's apartments, townhomes, houses, anywhere. And if we pull all of this together, all the things we've talked about so far, these are variables that are talked about in this literature that we would want to consider specifically through a college student lens. Next section, just some screening things. Again, it's not just me saying this. You will find several studies that really talk about encouraging academic institutions to really become informed about this topic and starting to screen students for this because if you can identify students that are impacted by this and provide the necessary help, supports, and services, that will hopefully make a huge difference in that student's life. From a screening lens too, just some things to consider just in general, if people really struggle with eating healthy, there's all kinds of variables to consider. Food insecurity being one, having that lack of knowledge around that financial, stressors, not having a place to live. I mean, these are all barriers, again, to take into account. 
We spoke about this pretty good before, but just as another study that talks about COVID-19 obviously amplified this variable for a lot of people around the world. This is a very well-known validated screening tool that you can find online. I would highly recommend if you're really interested in learning more about the topic of food insecurity, become familiar with this tool. You can just Google this. It's a really just simple to use questionnaire you can find online. They have great information on various websites about this tool. And food insecurity is a major factor for poor health outcomes. But I wanted to just visually show all of you just some of the other factors that are associated with poor health outcomes. This is really for anybody in society, but if you have students that are dealing with anything on this list, a combination of these factors, these are threats to that student's health and wellness and academic success. And again, as we've talked about before, Food insecurity is without a doubt a huge stressor. It is a trauma. If any of you study trauma, this is a variable that you need to consider depending on how long the person was dealing with food insecurity. Major trauma that we need to take into account. So this, in some cases, would be an area that many mental health counselors and professionals should also learn about. I just pointed this out too while we're on the trauma angle of this. This is just something to be aware of if any of you are nutritionist, if any of you are thinking about getting training in this area or supporting people with some of these kind of deficiencies, food insecurity, excessive sugar consumption. If we take a trauma lens to this, looking at some of the literature on trauma-informed nutrition assistance programming. So basically what this says is that when you're working with folks that seem to have a lot of nutritional deficiencies, problems with food and eating, in some cases that could be rooted in trauma. And if we can be more sensitive to that student's life history around trauma, adversity and hardship, that will play a role in the recovery process as well. So executive function, I mentioned this before, this is the boss of the brain the CEO of the brain, I did a training on this for Hawks Learning. I would recommend checking that out if, if you're interested in going deep in the weeds with this. But food insecurity, regardless of age, has been linked with more executive function impairments. And when someone has impairments in the area of executive function, this can impact their mood, their decision-making, their concentration levels, it plays a huge role in academic performance and success. And academic procrastination was another training I did for Hawks as well. So I'd recommend checking that out as well. But I wanted to throw this in here that in some cases, if your student is dealing with a high degree of academic procrastination, that could be a barrier for eating healthy. But unhealthy eating habits is also a potential barrier that can exacerbate procrastination. That last slide, we briefly talked about executive function. If you have students that procrastinate day in and day out, it seems like almost a pattern of behavior, that is likely rooted partially in an executive function impairment. And one other thing to consider if you really want to study procrastination, Technically, that is a self-regulation deficit. So if you look at it through that lens, that can help us better understand why some students do what they do. So emotional eating. For some individuals, emotional eating, they may eat foods that are extremely unhealthy for them. And this could be another factor that we need to consider during the food insecurity discussion. So emotional eating, more common among people that have had a lot of stressors in their life, worries, fears, this is anger control issues, more loneliness. Emotional eating could be a triggering event for some individuals as well, is definitely another variable to take into account when we consider this discussion. I just wanted to throw this out here. When we talked about the social skill deficits briefly before, if you wanna learn more about social skill deficits, I would highly recommend learning about the literature pertaining to social cognition. 
That's the umbrella term for how we function in the social environment. For some individuals, students in particular, if you're working with students that have a lot of social skill deficits, that could be a huge barrier for that student living a healthy life around eating habits and exercise habits, to name a few. Unfortunately as well, in some cases, food insecurity has been linked with more health risk coping strategies. So some of those would be higher incidence of substance misuse, poor decision-making. So if you have a student that makes a lot of poor decisions and engages in high risk coping, that's likely a variable that would fall under the umbrella of executive function as well. I believe later this year, I think it's next month or the month after, I'll be doing a training on the adverse childhood experiences research and its impact on college students. But if any of you have ever studied the ACES research, I would also look at the literature as it pertains to food insecurity. So even if you're working with adult students, what happened to them earlier on in life can still impact them into adulthood. That's gonna be the focus of that next training coming up. And for some of these students that you're working with as well, the food insecurity may be partially rooted in a lot of household stress. So maybe they were in a household before they came to college where there's a lot of stress a lot of chaos, a lot of worry. These are all things that can amplify problematic outcomes as well. As we move through this last section on just basic tips, strategies, solutions, eating healthy, having good food security is a critical component to optimal brain and body health. So this is another reason why I'm really passionate about this topic, because if we can really instill this knowledge into the professionals and into the students we work with, maybe we can play a role in optimizing health for all of us. Other factors to take into account that I spoke about before that I just wanted to reiterate here. If any of you are thinking about how do I, what do I do about this? How do I start combating this at my college? If you can get buy-in from administration, have the qualified professionals on staff, providing trainings, education, literature, handouts, resources that help combat some of these weaknesses you may see in some of your students, that is a very important target area. Encouraging students, if it's the right professional, encouraging it to have regular breakfast intake. Again, if your student is skipping breakfast every day, that could have a huge impact on how they perform in the classroom. Enhancing health literacy, Food literacy, nutritional literacy, again, offering courses, trainings, resources, helping your students learn how to obtain, understand, and process basic health information, very, very important. If we can promote student self-efficacy, that's been linked with better health outcomes. Students that have higher levels of self-efficacy are more likely to have better self-regulation, higher levels of motivation, greater levels of resilience, and the list goes on. I'll be doing a training. We haven't set the date yet, but it looks like maybe in January of next year for Hawks Learning on digestive health issues and its impact on college students. Why should you care about that? Because if the gut is off, the brain is off, the gut-brain health access. Food insecurity has been linked with more digestive health issues. It's actually a huge topic that we all need to be aware of that I don't think there's a lot of training out there through the academic lens. Be on the lookout for that coming up, I think, in January. If you referred your students, if you have someone on staff that does this, mindful eating interventions can be very helpful. Teaching students just about mindfulness-based practices around eating habits. It can help them be more aware of their nutritional intake, what they eat, why they eat it, how fast they eat it. These are other things. If we have any counselors or therapists on the college campus listening in, these are some things you would want to just consider through a therapeutic lifestyle changes lens. 
Self-compassion interventions have been shown to be very, very helpful and effective. If we can teach students and ourselves to have greater levels of self-compassion, it's been linked with all kinds of positive things, including increasing health-promoting behaviors. It can lower stress. This is a small snapshot of the literature out there. This is another intervention strategy that's been shown to be very, very helpful. And as we wrap up, these are just some basic interventions that consistently come up in this research literature in terms of what academic institutions may be able to start implementing to start combating this. For some colleges around the country, they've started implementing food pantry programs, partnering with community partnerships and meal donation programs and offering free weekly meals and even offering cooking classes, education classes to students. So these are some interventions that you might want to consider if you're thinking about implementing different protocols on your college campus. So I, I really appreciate all of you. I know I threw a lot of information at you in a short amount of time. I'm going to stick around as, as long as we need, answer any questions, thoughts, or concerns. And again, you have my email address. If you want a copy of my slides, I'll be more than happy to share them with you. So we have a question. Um, how does food insecurity affect academic performance on a biochemical level? Yeah, so think about this. So your student is eating foods. On the surface, it looks like that student doesn't have any nutritional deficiencies. They have plenty of access to food. But are they eating fast food? gas station food, microwavable food, sugar sweetened beverages. At the biochemical level, when we eat those kind of foods, what happens is it spikes our blood sugar levels. So now we have elevated blood sugar levels going on. After a little time, our blood sugar levels dip. So if we have lower levels of blood sugar, hypoglycemia, remember metabolic fuel for the brain so we can have more self-control deficits. That way of eating has also been linked with more gut dysbiosis. I'll talk about that in that digestive health training. When the gut is off, we have more disruptions in our gut. That impacts our mood, our behavior, our energy levels. And then if people eat this way day in and day out, in some cases, the literature points to the fact it can contribute to more sleep problems, more circadian rhythm misalignment. And these are all things that can throw off our whole biochemistry. It can impact homeostasis. So that's the best way I can summarize that question. Thank you. Yeah, you're um, welcome. One other question. Um, food insecurities may be a factor to consider in relation to criminal or violent behavior in the US. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a that's probably where I focus most of our, my energy on as it pertains to this topic is the forensic, legal, and criminal justice aspects of food insecurity. I'm actually giving a talk coming up to a different group on that very topic. And you will find numerous studies that talk about food insecurity as being a potential risk factor for violent behavior. I am aware of one study so far that talks about if you want to address the gun violence problem in the United States, we better start also addressing the food insecurity problem. It's not the only variable. You will find multiple studies that also talk about food insecurity within the context of domestic violence, increasing child abuse risk. And if any of you have ever worked like with parental incarceration, that is a huge factor that can disrupt the whole family. And it has been linked with having more food insecurity. So again, think about this. Why does it relate to anger, violence, and aggression in some cases? If we're not eating healthy and we're not putting the proper fuels into our body, our thinking is not as clear. We're more impulsive. We're more erratic. This is a trauma. It's not the only variable, obviously, when we're talking about criminality. But it is a factor. So if any of you are like criminal justice professionals, you would not, you would do quite well maybe offering a lecture on this topic or a module. There's a ton of literature out here on this. And it also plays a role 
in offender reentry. So probation parole officers aren't trained in this. They're missing a key component to helping folks who are involved in the criminal justice system disrupt that ongoing cycle of involvement. Great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have any closing remarks for us before we close out? Yeah, I appreciate all of you, everyone. Again, I know lots of lots of information thrown at you. This was a kind of a brief introduction into this big topic. Lots and lots of literature on this topic. If you're looking for more resources, you want to chat by phone sometime, I'm more than happy to steer you in the right direction if you do want to take your knowledge to that deeper level. So again, thank you, Hawks Learning as well, for the opportunity to present again for all of you. And I hope all of you have a wonderful day. Thank you. And thank you all for joining today. Um, we will be emailing you a link to view the recording of this webinar once it becomes available. If you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our Learning and Growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the Learning and Growing website, which I'm going to go ahead and link in the chat now for easy access. Uh, one second. Excuse me, technical difficulties, one second. Just about, all right, awesome. These free webinars are brought to you by Hawks Learning, an innovative educational coursework company. To learn more about our mastery-based course materials and how Hawks can enhance learning outcomes for you and your students, please visit hawkslearning.com. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you all for attending.